Be kindly seated. Please take your seats and be comfortable. As requested, you are uh, requested to kindly take your seats in the front rows. Ladies and gentlemen, I would also request you to kindly put your mobile phones on the silent mode. Forces from home and abroad. History is replete with examples of actions carried out by a small team of special forces which have changed not only the course of operations but also of the war. These men with extraordinary courage, dedication, abundant initiative, indomitable spirit, with scant respect their personal safety has achieved results where conventional forces could not be employed. Some of these actions have been documented while a lot of them remain shrouded in mystery because of political and security reasons. Special forces have been used from time immemorial. Some of the examples are specialized units of Hamilcar Barska of Sicily, Specialist units of Knight Templars in Crusade Wars, ninjas of China and Japan, even the employment of such forces also finds mention in the Indian military writing of Kutalya. But it is in the later half of the 20th century that special forces came into higher prominence. The governments discovered that objectives can sometimes be achieved by a small team of anonymous specialists, then a larger, much more politically controversial conventional deployment. The most recent example of these being Kosovo and Afghanistan. The future wars are going to be fought in the spectrum encompassing from nuclear, conventional, subconventional, as also in the domains of land, sea, undersea, air, space, and even cyberspace. The success against a superior or evenly matched adversary will be achieved by creating asymmetry. This is the space where the task of special forces would emerge. Their mission thus lies in geostrategic, strategic, operational, or tactical level, and maybe political military in nature like the ill-fated raid of British commandos in Libya last week. The era has also witnessed the mushrooming of special forces like Green Berets, Special Operation Groups, Naval SEALs, SAS, etc. In India, too, we had a similar trend by raising of para-commandos, Marcos, Garud of Defense Services, and Special Action Group of NSG, Cobra of Andhra Pradesh, and a host of others under the center and state police forces. In all the wars India has fought, these forces have merely been used at the tactical level. At times, mathematical distribution of specialist units is done at the tactical level. More recently, only limited employment of these forces has been seen in low intensity conflict and insurgency. Do these highly trained and motivated units have a role at the geostrategic level, both in war and peace? As the emerging regional power, we have to look at our area of interest from Straits of Hormuz to Straits of Malacca. Do we have a defined role for our forces or such forces in our area of interest. Also, who should plan their employment, their training, their equipping, and career progression? These are some of the issues that we would deliberate in the next two days. I'm sanguine that our panelists with their vast experience would enlighten us and show us the way ahead. The proceedings of this seminar along with the recommendations of Center for Joint Warfare Studies will be one of the inputs to headquarter ideas for evolution 
of a doctrine on employment of special forces, which on finalization will be put up to Chairman and Chief Staff Committee, who is present with us today. With these words, I would now request Admiral Joshi, CISC Headquarter IDS, to address the seminar. Uh, Chairman, Chiefs of Staff Committee and uh, Chief of Air Staff, Air Chief Marshal uh, P.V. Nayak, Jan Lamba, Vice Chief of Army Staff, General Leader, Astwile Sisk, General Calcutt, Director Emeritus St. Joe's, invitees from friendly foreign countries, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. At the outset, I would extend a very warm welcome to each one of you, and in particular, convey our sincere thanks to Chairman CUSC for having accepted our invitation to deliver the keynote address at this inaugural session of the seminar. Amongst eminent panelists for the seminar, we have speakers from Israel, France, Germany, and the former head and colonel commandant of the famed SAS from UK. Their rich experience accumulated under difficult combat conditions should provide us with considerable food for thought. I am sure that participants look forward to their presentations with a great deal of anticipation. History is replete with examples of spectacular and successful missions undertaken by special forces which have often turned the tide in a war. While there is a need to retain core competencies and individualities of services or arms, as in every other form of warfare, in special operations too, there is an overriding requirement of interoperability and jointness, without which success would be difficult to come by. Lack of coordination between individual components has often been cited as an impediment to achieving desired outcomes from a SF mission. I am sure the participants will address these issues in sufficient depth and at appropriate levels. In the November 2008 operation at Mumbai to weed out terrorists, SF operations again came into sharp focus. Though it was essentially a counter-terrorism operation, the importance of correct equipment and training while operating in an urban setting was highlighted in ample measure. I am confident that with the participation from the industry in this seminar, we should be able to take forward the process of identifying evolving technologies suitable to the Indian context. In trying to conceive a vision for special forces, we realize that there are many factors which are intertwined, ranging from policy and national security interests at the macro level to an effective command and control organization at the execution level. Equipping and training special forces requires an efficient supporting organizational structure that is vibrant and stays ahead of the game. The Special Operations Command architectures of different countries would certainly be a model to be examined so as to arrive at a structure for Special Forces that suits us best. Experts would debate such issues over the next two days and arrive at a way ahead in the concluding session. More than anything else, I believe it is the fleet-footedness Agility, the ability to think quickly on their feet and innovate to adopt rapidly to dynamic situations that sets apart a successful SF operation from an embarrassment. <coughs> it will seldom happen 
that local support background intelligence and complete knowledge of a rapidly evolving situation are available in an ideal manner sf operatives will constantly need to cultivate a mindset to succeed against overwhelming odds to illustrate this mindset that i am talking about i can do no better than recite a few lines from pandit ram prasad bismil's poem sar farushi ki tamanna those of you who saw the movie rang de basanti would readily recall these lines haath jin mein ho junoon katte nahi talwar se sar jo uth jate hain wo jhukte nahi lalkar se और भड़केगा जो शोला सा हमारे मन में है सरफरोशी की तमन्ना अब हमारे दिल में है दिस जुनून और द फेनेटिकल काइंड ऑफ माइंड सेट आई बिलीव इज अ क्रिटिकल रिक्वायरमेंट अपार्ट फ्रॉम ट्रेनिंग कोपिंग एंड प्रिपेयरनेस एज द की टू सक्सेसफुल एफ एस एफ ऑपरेशन टू बोरो फ्रॉम शेक्सपियर्स जूलियस सीजर योन कैसियस has a lean and hungry look he thinks too much such men are dangerous to my mind sf operatives have to be lean and hungry not in the physical sense but in the sense of craving for successful operations against overwhelming odds they have to be thinking men they have to be dangerous men with that gentlemen i'll request chairman suesc to deliver his keynote address thank you very much for your attention जनरल जोशी जनरल कलकट जनरल कपूर श्री जयंत बरनवाल डिस्टिंग गेस्ट इन द ऑडियंस फ्रॉम इंडिया एंड अब्रॉड फ्रॉम माई फिजिक आई एम श्योर ऑल ऑफ यू अंडरस्टूड दैट आई एम नॉट अ स्पेशल फोर्सेस मैन वंस अपॉन अ टाइम आई कुड हैव बीन बट नॉट नाउ वेल ऑल द सेम इट्स अ प्लेजर टू बी अबाउंग यू and the amongst the acclaimed strategists and extremely experienced professionals to deliberate upon a subject which has a growing significance in today's evolving security scenario is certainly not about license to kill but more about capability to enforce the will and i'll come back to this a little later there was a time when 007 as you all know had his handlers hearts in his in their mouths with his antiques and the beautiful miss money penny ruling all over however the realities in today's world are much more threatening as compared to the glamorous fiction commandos slithering down to the rooftop at nariman point or sas evacuating their citizens are more frequent today as is the evolution of the bonds into their new avatar so what is it that makes all of us talk so much about special forces operations more today than say yesterday or day before structured military activities have always required the support of specialized assets in order to achieve their objectives hence special forces have gained in prominence over the years it has been found that certain objectives can easily be achieved like it was brought out by the speakers before me by a smaller team of specialists than a larger and much more politically controversial deployment carved out from the regular armed forces cadre or security forces special forces are high value assets and this is one point that we need to keep in mind throughout highly capable of delivering effects 
disproportionate to their size. If you look at today's what I call fourth generation warfare, it basically encompasses attempts to circumvent or undermine an enemy's strengths while exploiting his weaknesses. This warfare thrives on using methods that differ substantially from the opponent's usual modus operandi. Now, throughout their evolution during the 20th and 21st century, the Special Forces units have had many spectacular successes in achieving national objectives also. No wonder that the mention of Special Forces instantly fills us with a bit of overwhelming kind of awe and respect for these brave men. Legends abound about having six drinks and thereafter eating the glass and then running 25 miles to capture an objective. All of us have heard these legends. Some of them are true. In today's era of fewer wars and more conflicts, subconventional threats assume greater significance. Neutralizing threats across the entire spectrum of conflict poses challenges which are quantitatively and qualitatively different. Hence, ladies and gentlemen, we will need to cater for a full spectrum of threats from nuclear confrontation through conventional war to conflicts limited in area, scope or objectives. We need, therefore, a full range of capabilities with the ability to dynamically swing between them. Future conflicts, as I am sure all of you will agree, are likely to be swift, sharp, intense, as well as more challenging and more unpredictable. They will require a capability for assured, calibrated and flexible responses, as well as a projection of national power in all forms. Being a combat aviator, I understand the pivotal position that Special Forces occupy in the prosecution of military operations. And, I'm, and I am aware that these are the forces that can be surgically employed in conflict scenarios to achieve your aims. The fact that a lot of nations are downsizing their armed forces and adding muscle to their special forces says it all. There is much to learn from the experience of special operations across the world, be it Iran, Iraq and now Afghanistan, which have demonstrated the increasing employability and viability of special forces. All successful and some not so successful missions like NTB, Mogadishu, the Iranian embassy siege, etc. require political and military backing for success of any kind. The current Libyan crisis where British and German special forces came for specialized operations and evacuation of their citizens has reiterated the fact that special forces are going to be the X factor for achieving national objectives. Obviously, why should India be left behind? Well, all of us understand <coughs> that special forces can be employed for strategic, operational as well as tactical roles. We are also aware that SF operations include a multitude of operations inclusive, inclusive of seared, counter-air, close-air support, etc. But what is important is understanding their high-value significance. The fact is that SF operations are intrinsically joint but different from conventional forces and that they are not really a substitute for conventional forces. Be it unconventional warfare, counter-terrorism, psyops, or counter-proliferation, the roles are plenty. But for each role, special forces will always be dependent on detailed intelligence, intimate and responsive command and control, as they have the ability to bypass all sea or land objectives. The planning also has to cater for mobility, counter-mobility, survivability, fire support, communications, link-up, etc. And hence, planning is as important as the 
execution. In today's warfare, where there is a blur between war and politics, soldier and civilian targets, peace and conflict, battlefield or fratricide, there is a big, big challenge in SF operations. Additional challenges include integration with conventional forces as well as government agencies when needed. However, in all this, the special forces must preserve their autonomy to protect and encourage the unconventional approach, which is the soul of SF. On the part of powers that be, there is an inability, I feel, to conceptualize the application of special operations theory and doctrines, especially in our context. Added to it, there is an inexplicable reluctance on the part of our military to force and forge an integrated joint services approach towards the SF and special operations. All this is because, in my opinion, even the military poorly understands SF capabilities and they see the SF as the shadow guys who go and fight their own war. While I do not wish to dwell on aspects that are best left to experts, I do hope the seminar examines the issue of concept of employment of special forces in its entirety during the next couple of days. In India, we have 10,000 plus special forces. They are scattered, service specific or domain specialized. The question is, do we have a national vision or policy for the employment and the risk taking of these forces. As you know, there is a political fallout for the kind of missions undertaken by special forces. Now, while political will can change overnight, the capability cannot be built overnight. In the current scenario, when sometimes the adversaries dictate the rules of engagements, we require to act swiftly flexibly and decisively. The reaction time would ultimately decide the outcome of a mission. In crisis situations, special forces could create the much needed headway in unpredictable ways and enable conventional forces to regroup, plan and strike. Therefore, a quicker reaction time would mean that we pack some essentials into this tight-knitted entity. The special forces must have a flatter command and control structure, high mobility, flexibility in thought and action, sound intelligence, communications backup, technological superiority, and the biggest advantage of all, secrecy and security, both during peace and war. These vital constituents make the special forces adaptable, lethal units capable of achieving limited objectives and what is important is that thereby opening a large number of options to the national leadership. In times of crisis like the 26-11 incident in Mumbai, what the leadership needed were options. So special forces could create many more options for the national leadership in times of national crisis. It is important that first we clearly identify the roles and missions within our sphere of operations. Deliberations during the seminar should provide you with good pointers in this direction. While equipping training
require a national level policy well laid down for this vital element of security of our nation, that is special forces. We at SPs remain committed with our intentions to do everything to complement the cause of security and defense of our country. Joining hands uh, with St. Joe's is a reflection of our humble reflect, uh, intentions. We are honored by the presence of Chief of Air Staff taking out time from out of his uh, very busy, busy schedule. Thank you, for, thank you, sir, for this. We are grateful that our panelists from abroad could take time to share their views. The panelists who are the distinguished speakers of Special Forces to come and share their views with us. back and we are ready to start. I think we have been able to put in some life there, but I think it's still on the ventilators. So as long as it keeps functioning, we are good to go. We start with our first session where the topic is concept of employment of foreign special forces. I now take this opportunity of inviting and introducing the chairperson of the session, Lieutenant General Retired HS Leader. PVSM, UISM, YSM, VSM, ADC, former CISC, headquarters IDS. A commando dagger, he has served in three para, nine para special forces, ten para special forces, and commanded nine para special forces with distinction in Operation Pavan. He has been an instructor in commando school, Belgaon, and senior commando wing, Army War College, Mao. He was the first military liaison officer in Embassy of India at Colombo during Operation Pavan. He has been the defense military advisor in Embassy of India in Washington for over three years. The general has extensive experience of sub-conventional warfare, having commanded a brigade along the line of control in Mendhar district of Jammu and Kashmir. He assumed the appointment of chief of integrated defense staff to the chairman Chief of Staff Committee on 3rd March 2006 and hung his uniform on the 1st of October 2008. I invite the chairperson of the session, Lieutenant General, retired HS Leader, as the chairperson of the session, ladies and gentlemen. I now introduce and invite the speakers of this session, Lieutenant General, retired Sir Graham Lamb. KBE CMG DSO, former head of SAS and commander of the British Field Army. Commissioned into the Queen's own Highlanders, he has served in numerous staff and operational appointments. He has overseen global operations, specifically the Balkans, Afghanistan, and Iraq. I invite him as the first speaker of the session. Our next speaker, Brigadier General Eyal Eisenberg, Commander Gaza Division, Israel Defense Forces. As a Commander Gaza Division from 2008 to 10, 
he led the caste lead operation. He was a commander of the paratroopers division from 2005 to 2008. He has also commanded the Israeli withdrawal from the security zone in southern Lebanon. He was a commander of the Shaldag unit, the Air Force Special Forces. From 95 to 96, he was the head of Operation Branch, Air Force Special Forces Command. I invite him as the second speaker of this session. Our third speaker, Colonel Lancia Philip, French Air Force. He was commissioned as Nuclear Security Officer in 1989. And in 1995, he was commissioned as Instructor at the Air Academy in Salon. In 2007, at FR SOCOM headquarters, he led the International Relationship Division for